again, buonasera, benvenuti, welcome to the Embassy of Italy. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight for this uh, very popular uh, program with uh, world-renowned classicist Professor Mary Beard. It is uh, my pleasure and honor to invite to the podium for some welcome remarks our Deputy Chief of Mission, Minister Maurizio Greganti. Thank you very much, Emanuele, and uh, good evening to everybody. We are very happy to have uh, such a large audience tonight. Um, I have to say that I asked uh, to introduce this uh, conversation because uh, I'm very passionate about uh, classical studies. Uh, myself, I had an education which was based on uh, ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, in Italy, and where we studied a lot of these uh, languages, not so much uh, of English, but then I could recover later. So I'm very uh, grateful, happy to do this, and thank you to Manuel and Julia uh, who organized this. Um, this evening program is in the wider framework of the 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage. The motto of this initiative is Our Heritage, where the past meets the future. And tonight's conversation will focus exactly on this aspect, showing why ancient Rome matters today. I think we all agree that uh, that is still ancient Rome is still very much <coughs> present today. Um, our civilization, the Western civilization, is based on the Roman culture and on the Greek culture. Uh, these are really the basis of. Uh, our culture, and I would say notably of our political discourse. Our political thinking today is very much based on the, on the language, on the concepts which were created by our Greek and Roman ancestors. Uh, let me recall the Roman experience with the Republic and the Empire, the importance of the Roman law, uh, the Roman legal system which was the basis of the Empire. Com concepts which today are you know, familiar to all of us, like sovereignty, like authority, like citizenship, these are all based on the Roman legal system. The checks and balances, which we always say this is the basis of every good democracy, and for sure the, the American democracy, was based on the American Republic. The two consuls, the Senate, uh, the uh, popular assemblies, that was the core of that system which lasted, as you know, several centuries. But the contribution of the Romans uh, to our time is not limited to the political thinking or to the, uh, to the law, to the, local, to the legal system. But think also, for example, about architecture, uh, city planning. Uh, I have to say that for an Italian in Washington, D.C., uh, it's uh, simply amazing to see how much of this capital is inspired by the Roman architecture. If you go in the mall, if you see all the buildings which were built uh, two centuries ago, I mean, the inspiration there was clear. Uh, the same goes for, uh, in general, the, the environment where the Romans lived, uh, globalization. Today we speak a lot about globalization, or with term which is a sort of criticism of globalism, but they lived in a globalized world. It was an empire, uh, and they had the problems also of which we are facing today of globalization, for example, migration, because a lot of peoples uh, flocked to, to Rome, and they had a lot of problems that we still face today. The Mediterranean was the center of the world, we cannot say today that the Mediterranean is the center of international politics, but I would say very much so. At least it's one of the epicenters. You know, Europe, Mediterranean, Middle East, they are very much front and center of uh, international politics and the work we do as diplomats. Uh, let me stop here. I said too much. This is the, the subject, of course, of the conversation. And let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we are very honored to have tonight with us Dr. Mary Beard. She is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Cambridge, 
and she's credited with making ancient Rome come alive to wider audiences with her numerous books and a popular BBC TV host. In her latest book, Women and Power, a Manifesto, she explores misogyny from its ancient roots up to contemporary times. Leading the conversation will be Professor Richard Hodges, former president of the American University of Rome and currently serving on the board of the Instituto Packard, Italian affiliate of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Uh, Dr. Hodges is the author of many books, and during his long career, he has focused on the archaeology of the later Roman world and the early Middle Ages in Western Europe. He launched excavations in England and Italy, and as scientific director of the Boutrin Foundation from 1993 to 2012, he oversaw new excavations and management of the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Boutrin in Albania. Tonight's program is the result of a long collaboration between the Italian Embassy, the Italian Cultural Institute, and the American University of Rome. I would like to thank the American University of Rome and all our friends that helped making this event possible. Grazie, enjoy. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Richard Hodges, the president of the American University of Rome, and I'm here, as you've heard, with my old friend, Mary Beard. Our friendship goes back many years, more than three decades, when we did some probably silly things back in the 1980s. <laughs> uh, somewhat irreverent, that certainly would have, uh, these days, got me into lots of trouble, and probably got you, Mary, into lots of trouble. I'd like to thank the Italian Embassy for hosting this event for the American University of Rome, in particular uh, Consigliere um, Giganti and Consigliere Amendola. I'd like to thank uh, Carl Colby and Tom Dustenberg, our board member, for making this happen. But most of all, I'd like to thank Mary for squeezing us in. You'll realize why when I explain uh, a little bit about Mary in a moment. Before I do, one minute on the American University of Rome. We're a small university on the Janiculum Hill, close to paradise, I'd say. We always say it is paradise, just down from the American Academy. Beautiful spot, you can see the whole of Rome from where our 500 students are. We've been there for 25 years. Next year, we're 50 years old. We were originally founded by a wonderful, adventurous veteran from the Second World War who allegedly founded us, you'll be surprised to hear, as a school for spies. Uh, uh, that is, American spies coming to Rome. I'm not sure how true that is. Carl knows more about those things than I do. I'm just making that bit up. But the long and the short of it is, we have 500 students. They come from half from America, half from around the world, and they study basically in this wonderful place to an American accredited degree. It's, uh, it's truly a special experience, and as we, as we develop this experience, we're doing a couple of things. First, we're developing a signature program based around Empire, so Rome SPQR is not insignificant to that, and the fact that next week we hire a new classics professor is rather important to us. And secondly, we're putting in an honours program based around social entrepreneurship. And I can see the professor down at the end who's responsible for that. As we try to bring the best of the new world to one of the most fundamental places of the old world, and in particular to a place that has new meaning, Rome, given its place in Europe today, its place in the Mediterranean, and its relationship to Africa. So AUR is a special place, most of all because we have some wonderful honorary degree holders one of whom is Professor Mary Beard. Now, who is Mary? My God. She is, uh, she's Professor at Cambridge, as you've heard. She's been there for more than three decades. She's actually celebrated for her teaching. I know she's best known from her television shows, but actually if you go up and down the halls of classics departments, in the United States or Europe, they'll all say, wow, what a teacher. She specializes in Roman religion, cults, I'll come back to that, the late Republic, the early empire, 
But most of all, she's interested in narrative, human stories, agency in the past, and agency today. She was responsible for a wonderful introduction to the classics 20 more years ago, a great book on Roman art, an absolutely superb biography of really her role model, I'd say, we'll come back to this, Jane Harrison, from the early part of the 20th century. Studies of the Parthenon, the Colosseum, Pompeii, the Roman triumph, and then laughter in the ancient world, in ancient Rome, SPQR, and now Women in Power, a manifesto, which you heard mentioned earlier on, which is an easy and very engaging read, which is coming before her new work, which is on civilizations. But having told you all of that, and I suspect most of you are here, because her first book was The Good Working Mother's Guide. <laughs> and I bet not many of you knew that. Uh, I knew that because we shared a publisher in common, and we shared his settee where we drank too much whiskey. And from that, uh, from that experience in the old piano factory in Camden, we both got our careers, so to speak, and hers led to the Times Literary Supplement, where she writes blogs, and has done now for more than a decade, and two blog compilations of Don's life, and all in a Don's day, and that has led to the tweeting, which has made her a figure of enormous status in Great Britain. As I said to our board this week, I bet you can't name the Prime Minister of Great Britain, but I bet you can remember Mary Beard, uh, which I'm afraid is the case. It probably says more about our board. Oh, our, 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 Prime Minister. our Prime Minister. She's made many films, and we'll come back to these. Pompeii, Caligula, Julius Caesar just came out, and she's just completed work on civilizations, or rather, she is completing, because when she lands back on Sunday, they are taking her off immediately to film the 10th episode, so she squeezed us in. And for all of that, she was w awarded the OBE, that is... Uh, yourself. <laughs> yes, like yourself. The, which is the Order of the British Empire. And as she said, she was ordered it, she was given it for all the work she'd done on drama reconstruction. And, as, and I read from her blog why drama reconstruction, why has her documentaries been so important? Because drama reconstruction, oh Marcus, please pass the grapes while I adjust the sheet is passing for my toga, is deeply insulting to many audience. Sadly, they don't get it. A, a-list actors, and they are always deeply misleading, recasting the ancient world as a magnified version of the modern. So the question is, how can you grab an audience for what you want to say without going down that A-list actor route? So Mary is, without doubt, as many of you will have seen The Guardian recently, the feature of the cult of Mary Beard, which is appropriate, since she works on cults, and it's around that I'm going to begin these questions tonight and then bring some of you in, as you wish, to try over the next hour or so to find out what Mary thinks and what she shouldn't think and so on. <laughs> Mary, why Rome? Why Italy? Um, it's a big question, isn't it? Um, I think, in, in some ways, I think, you know, why on earth not? I mean, uh, I don't actually see... This is liable to sound terribly conservative. I don't actually see that you could be a fully functional citizen or cultural citizen of the West without engaging in some way with ancient Rome. Now, in saying that, I don't mean to be... That's not meant to be as elitist as it sounds, because I think you often meet people and you say, oh, what do you know about ancient Rome? And they say, absolutely nothing. Um, you then say, did you see the film Gladiator? And they say, oh, yes. You know, do you know about Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra or Asterix the Gaul? But everybody is brought up in some way in the West with bits of Rome in their head. 
and I think it's terribly important that we should look at those and interrogate them and know them better and know why they're not quite like what we think they are, you know, and so forth. Now, I think it's also true, thank heavens, that um, Rome isn't the only culture we have in our heads, you know. Thank heavens the West is not simply uh, the inheritor of Greece and Rome. It would be an appalling place to live in if it was, you know, we're better than the Romans. Um, uh, uh, and we have a diversity which way extends beyond that. But, you know, if you think, I mean, I often think about something like the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid, um, which I think a, a lot of people have read, at least in part, in English or in Latin. And I think, I often say to my students, um, if you think of any work of literature that has, in which there has never been a day in the last 2,000 years when somebody hasn't been reading it, then the Aeneid has to be the no-brainer work of literature, which that's the case. So I think it's a kind of, it's a not being able to do without Rome, and also a desire to think harder so we're not taken in by Rome. I mean, you know, uh, I don't like the Romans. I, I, I would hate, you know, I, you know, they're very interesting. I don't like them. I would, the last thing I'd ever want to do, you know, is, is to imagine even a day trip, really, back to the ancient world. It's horrible. But somehow they, they are inescapable. They're absolutely inescapable, and therefore we have a duty to make sure that we know them well, now that doesn't mean everybody learning Latin and everybody becoming a classicist, you know, because that also would be a very dull world. But it means, you know, and happily, kind of cultural knowledge is, is shared. It's a communal operation. But I, mean, I, I do think the idea that there will be a world in which nobody knew about that and nobody could share that <laughs> is, I think, a nightmare. And I also think it won't happen, you know. I mean, classicists are always foretelling the death of their subject, you know. They've been foretelling that since about 200 AD, you know. And they're always saying, oh, we don't know Latin as well as we used to. You know, it's a very, very nostalgic subject in some ways. And yet, actually, it thrives on its own nostalgia, you know. It thrives on rescuing itself every generation. So I don't worry about it going to collapse. Um, I think it'll be fine, and I think we need it. You never thought to... You began, Mary, believe it or not, began when she was a teenager, like I did, excavating on medieval sites in rural <laughs> England. Yes. And, but you were never tempted to become a medievalist or a, a Greek scholar, like one of your heroines, Jane Harrison. I, I think I'm, I'm... I don't really much mind, in a way, which bit of the past I study. I mean, I've landed in Rome, and I think you know, there's very good reasons for landing in Rome. But I could have landed in Greece. I could have landed in the Middle Ages. I was just explaining now, uh, uh, um, you know, how it was that I first actually got into history, and it was with the ancient Egyptians. Right. Originally, I went, to, I went to the British Museum when I was five, and my mum thought it was time that I kind of went to London because I lived in rural Shropshire, you know, 150 miles away, and I wanted to see the Egyptian mummies, um, and. We went to the mummies and then we wanted to look around the other bits of Egypt they had. And, and in a museums, this was 1960, museums then were terribly unchild friendly. Every case was far too high if you were a five year old. And the labels were terribly small and, and you know, graying at the edges. Um, but there was in this case um, what was supposed to be a 3,000 year old or more carbonized piece of Egyptian cake. <laughs> I was absolutely desperate to see, but of course it was right at the back of this case, it was too high. And my mum was kind of lifting me up um, to help me see it. And, uh, but it, I was quite heavy and it was quite difficult. Man walked past, who I, I've got no idea who he was, but he must have been a curator. And he saw this little scene going on and he got some keys out of his pocket. He opened the case and he brought the cake out for me. Oh, really? And I think ever after that, 
you know, that was a kind of moment of thinking not only that history was really exciting, but there were ways in which cases were open for you, that people brought you into it. So, right. um, and, but the other thing I suppose that I want to insist here is that um, I don't think being interested in history means being buried in the past. You know, if you're interested in history, what it means is you're interested in now and the past. And it, history doesn't make sense without that other bit to it, now and the past. And I think it's particularly important in consciousness raising about the past, about the present, in, in helping you see yourself from the outside. And I often say to my first year students, um, what do you think the Romans would be surprised at about us? And they, they usually find this a very hard question to answer. They think the Romans would admire us deeply, um, but they're not very sure they find anything very surprising. And you say, do you know the Romans didn't have prisons? I didn't know that. Didn't no, you? No, I didn't know that. And you know, somehow the idea of there being a penal system that doesn't have a prison... Now, I'm not sure that we would like to repeat the Roman penal system, which was, you know, basically a clip round the ear, exile, death or a fine were the options. But incarceration... Crucifixion too. And crucifixion. Yeah, yeah. Incarceration was not on the Romans' punitive agenda. Now, suddenly, you start to see how... You start to see the oddities about your own culture. Yeah. And you see the oddities about your own culture by seeing it from the outside. And that can literally be the outside in geographical terms, but it can also be the outside in historical terms. Wow, yes. Well, that was my second question. But do you think today, as you look at the Roman world, in particular, especially in the light of the book that you've just published, do you think that the Roman silencing of women was, what do you think about that? Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, not, well, I think the, the big point, really, of the book I've just written about women and power is to say that, like it or not, and I don't mean that this is natural, I mean it's culturally learned, like it or not, uh, the culture of at least the West, and may well be more widely, of the 21st century, is deeply embedded in essentially the misogyny of antiquity. And the book starts with um, what I hope and write in saying uh, is the first example of a man shutting a woman up in Western history. And it is uh, from the beginning of Homer's Odyssey when Penelope, waiting at home <coughs> for the wandering Odysseus, to come back from the Trojan War. She goes downstairs, um, and there's a bard singing, and the bard is singing songs about how awful it is for the heroes uh, of Greece to get back home like Odysseus from the Trojan War. And Penelope, not unreasonably, says, so for heaven's sake, can't you sing something a bit more cheerful? Um, and her son, the rather weedy Telemachus, turns to her and says, Mother, shut up, speech is man's business. <laughs> back upstairs, and back she goes. And I read the Odyssey, I think, for probably 20 or 30 years before I even noticed that. You know, you could, it's very easy to read it and just to think, you know, you go from one line to the next and you're struggling a bit with the Greek and you don't entirely notice it. And I thought, heavens, that is the very beginning of the tradition of guys shutting women up in our culture, and also not, not big, powerful guys even. You know, Telemachus is a teenager. You know, he is a teenager who is trying to grow up, and he is shutting his mother up. And shutting his mother up is actually part of his maturation. Now, and in a sense, I take it from there, really, and I think, look, that... that terribly culturally hardwired in our heads are things about the relationship between men and women and the silencing of women, which goes back millennia. Now, in some ways that's terribly depressing because you think that's going to make it harder to change. Um, 
But at least it, I think it opens up a new way of thinking about women's silence, thinking about the, in a sense, the, um, the political discrimination that women suffer, and it kind of shows there's a history to it. And I think if you kind of start to understand the history, you start to have a better way, better idea of what you might do about it. And was that in your mind when you did SPQR? Because there's an awful lot of men in SPQR. There's an awful <laughs> lot of men in most history. Yeah. Yeah. History, you know, there are people in this room uh, who've done something to try to rectify that in relation to uh, Roman history. Um, but, I mean, I think that Uh, well, what I say to my graduate students is, if you actually really, really have your first priority in the research on history you want to do, to work on a subject where you can analyse the feelings, the experience, the testimony and the writing of women, then to choose either ancient Greece or ancient Rome would be a damn stupid subject, you know, <laughs> because you're not going to find it. On the other hand, uh, if you want to look at a culture that in many ways has established a whole load of our uh, conventions about, how, about gender relations, then Greece and Rome is an extremely good place to start. It's taking you back to where you can see in its horrible essentials and fascinating essentials um, uh, the nature of of how women and men have been categorised and deemed to relate to one another. And Rome, as the empire took shape, was very much a dialectical relationship between Augustus and his great wife Livia in some ways. Well, or so am I exaggerating? So Roman that? men said. Yes. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> all these, I mean, all, and Robert Graves. I mean, yes. we, we have been brought up with the idea that somehow behind every great Roman emperor there was a manipulative, supportive, scheming, and often poisoning woman, right? <laughs> now, uh, I mean, I, I'd rather like the idea that, um, that that's true. Um, I think it's much more to do with male fantasy. Right. You know, how, when you get to an imperial power with one man really taking charge, how do you explain his actions? Well, usually you say, huh, that's because the wife told him what to do. I, I, I remember this also, and we're not immune to this. And in the UK, um, in, when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, the papers regularly imagined that it was Cherie Blair that was masterminding all this. And I remember when I was much younger, you know, Nancy Reagan was supposed to control Ronnie, wasn't she? She was supposed to be, they were supposed to be by the fire, you know, in their dressing gowns, and Nancy would set the agenda. Now, we don't actually believe this is true. But uh, you know, the, this idea of the woman as the power behind the throne is usually a male fantasy for explaining some of the bonkers things that men do. <laughs> 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 <There's a laughs> Blame the wife, you know. And Augustus, you, you, lo you obviously love Augustus, though. No, I, don't, I don't love any of them. I mean, we wouldn't, you know, in eight, we, would, we would be horrified if a Roman walked in today. I mean, but they're all of them, you know, it is a politics that we can't ignore. You know, Augustus really is the first man that we can see in the West from, uh, from direct testimony first man who starts out life as a terrorist and reinvents himself as a senior citizen, father of his country, elder statesman and a safe pair of hands. All across the world today, there are leaders that start his life as something close to a terrorist and are now elder statesmen. And Augustus was the man who first did that brilliant and completely baffling transformation. You have a wonderful line in one of your TLS uh, essays that Augustus, if he'd looked at Mussolini, would have been rather admiring of him. I mean, or Mussolini would have been rather I admiring of Augustus. It goes well, both ways. Yes, exactly. It goes both ways. Yes. Oh, look, it, uh, uh, 
I think Augustus is a really interesting first emperor of Rome, um, sort of gone down both in the ancient world and the modern world as, you know, we forget the original bit, you know, the, the civil war Augustus, the man who would apparently tear out his enemy's eyes uh, with his bare hands, you know, um, and we remember the, the, senior, the senior statesman. Um, and Augustus is, in all kinds of ways, uh, a dictator. And the, even the name, you know, Augustus, he wasn't born Augustus, he was born Octavius. Um, and after, you know, part of, part of the reason that he's kind of managing to put his um, civil war past behind him and take uh, control of Rome, you know, part of the, the tactic is to take a new name. And it's reported that he had quite a lot of discussion about what name to take. And he rejected Romulus because Romulus had, been, had killed his brother and that wasn't a very good sort of omen for, for Augustus. And so they fix on Augustus. It's a name that means absolutely nothing. It's an invented name and, in a sense, revered one or dear leader is probably as close as we can get to it. And it must have sounded, um, I mean this with all due humility about Korea, it must have sounded very North Korean when he did it. <laughs> and, North Korean. And yet now, 2,000 years later, you know, instead of thinking that Augustus means revered one dear leader uh, in, in a very aggressive way, we think it's, well, it became the title that every Roman emperor took and we now take it for granted. And you love Cicero, too, who's another of your heroes, <laughs> the quintessential public intellectual. Do you ever fear, I asked you this over lunch, and she laughed, do you ever fear you'll end up without a head and hands, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> after some Caesar reeks revenge? I, um, I did my thesis, my PhD thesis on Cicero, um, it was one of the most boring PhDs that anybody <laughs> was entitled The State Religion in the Late Roman Republic, a study based on the works of Cicero. And it was never published for good reason, I think. It was very dull. Um, and for a long time in my life, I kind of thought that although Cicero, who's left us, you know, actually, Cicero is the only Roman that we can ever know in any detail, left us acres of speeches, of private letters, of treatises, and so forth. I thought that it was an extremely interesting collection of testimony about the ancient world. But, you know, if, if, you'd, if you'd fed me a couple of drinks and asked me sincerely to say whether I thought Cicero was a bit dull, I would have said he was. Um, it wasn't until I was doing my book on laughter <coughs> that I came to see the other side of Cicero, because... Uh, I started reading much more about um, his famous habit of joking. And, uh, and I read Plutarch's um, life of Cicero rather more carefully. And I then discovered that instead of being a kind of frightful, pompous, stuffed shirt, you know, kind of awful Roman dressed in a toga, being very serious, Cicero's reputation in the ancient world was as the funniest man that had ever lived. There were collections of his jokes, and his big fault, it was said, was that he never knew when to stop joking, so he was <laughs> always doing it at the most inappropriate times. Um, and suddenly I thought, heavens, yes. you know, this man is not quite as I have, quite as we, you know, we made Cicero, to, we reinvented Cicero, it was boring, so we could teach him to little boys at English private schools in the mid-19th century and later, right? So he had to be made boring, like Caesar, you know. Uh, actually, if you look differently at many of these characters, you find that, you know, what the Western educational system has done to some of them is made them dull when they never were. They never, and I now think of Cicero. I think Robert Harris's trilogy about Cicero probably gets it better than most academic work, really. That you know, Cicero is witty, he's awkward, he's pushy, uh, and he's very, very funny. And he's very public. He's very public. Yes. Um, he won't shut up. Yes. <laughs> and he can't keep a good joke in. 
which is good, but not unlike you sometimes, if I may say. <laughs> sometimes he says things that might have been better unsaid. Said, yes, well, we might come to that in the questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm also very curious, having read recently your biography of Jane Harrison, how you, how you come to the point where the damnatio memoriae, she writes out, uh, they write each other out of their stories. Are you ever tempted to write people out of your histories as you write history? Are you ever tempted by trying to find a new way to avoid dangerous characters or characters you've had some emotional relationship with? Modern or ancient? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Modern, yes, certainly. <laughs> uh, yes, I've got quite a lot of people who, who, who don't get a mention the footnotes out of my distaste. Um, ancient characters, no. I mean, I'm much more concerned. I mean, you haven't got enough ancient characters that you can afford to kind of send some of them into oblivion. You know, you need them all because... Um, you need to write about them and you need to think about them. What I do resist in terms of the modern, in terms of the ancient world, is the standard uh, ways that we have of talking about them. I mean, what, think, uh, the phrases we consistently use. You know, Alexander, the greatest conqueror of the ancient world. And you think, well, since when was being a conqueror great? Right? And what I'm much more interested in doing is kind of unseating those sort of cliches that come with these people and say, all right, let's try replacing conqueror with bloodthirsty massacre. <laughs> and do we get a different picture? Yes. Uh, sometimes one gets, there are a lot of fans of Alexander out there, I can tell you. And when you write this, you get a hell of a lot of emails um, telling you that you don't understand the virtues of Alexander. But it's those kind of things. It's sort of... Um, I've just made, as you said, this, this uh, TV documentary on Julius Caesar. And there, uh, you know, the tendency is, even for me, just to slip into the old clichés. You know, Julius Caesar, the most successful conqueror that Rome... And think, suddenly it's kind of boy's own paper stuff. Yeah. Um, and you know, Caesar marching across and massacring this tribe. You know, so... One of the things I want to do is to try to bring back the other side, to read all these characters against the grain. Um, uh, you know, Caesar, that there were people in Rome who wanted, even in Rome, wanted to accuse Caesar of war crimes. Uh, Ro the Romans' tolerance for brutality in war, you know, was pretty high. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, the people said he's going too far. You, know, you think it was genocide. What Caesar did in Gaul was genocide. And other emperors, you, I mean, you're about to work on emperors as, and a new book you were telling me, but as you work on this, I'm re reflecting on the fact that one of your films was about Caligula. Yeah. Why Caligula? Why, what attracted you to him? Because, because of all the movies, really. Because right. you know, if, you, if you go uh, out and you do some vox pop and you ask people for the names of Romans that they've heard of, you will have... Julius Caesar, you won't get Augustus actually in the street lab, Julius Caesar you'll have Nero and a close third will be Caligula thanks to the soft porn movie really in the <laughs> 1960s you know, where he kind of where, you know, what he got up to in swimming pools. You know, I think Dame me. Helen Mirren was yeah, in there. Was, it was made by Penthouse, wasn't it? It's Bob Guccione made this movie with the Penthouse pets and then a load of really great actors like Helen Mirren and Ian McKellen, I think. Right. And the story goes is that, that these two casts were kept completely different. So Helen Mirren claims she never knew that there were porn scenes being, <laughs> being shot in the evening because she was only on set in the morning, right? I used to be much more contrarian than I am, and I used to think that... Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would set out, I would to rehabilitate Caligula, you know, right. rehabilitate Nero. Now I'm not so keen on doing that, but I'm keen in taking um, figures from the, from the ancient world that people have a kind of name recognition of and a, a kind of set of, you know, set of stereotypes that we could all uh, come out with and trying to unpick those and to... And, and in doing Caligula, I was most of all interested 
in sharing with people how you would go about finding out about them. Because I think that an awful lot of popular history treats the audience as a bit stupid, or at least uninterested, and wants to tell a story which doesn't allow any doubt or ambiguity, it doesn't say how do we get this story, it doesn't say what the evidence is. And with someone like Caligula, you can actually, in an hour's documentary, give people a pretty good idea of what the problems are about literally getting a life story. Right. You know, and you can point out very clearly that he never made his horse a consul. You know, it is not even. You know, nobody in the ancient world even says that he made his horse. Is that right? No. <laughs> he says he threatened to make his horse a consul, but it's quite different. Right. And you know, often people people now come much more often to say. Um, you know, this looks like it was a joke at the Senate. You know, that all the Roman elites are being so hopeless and you know, so kind of um, self-abasing that at some point, you know, this rather young, impetuous emperor says, "Oh, for heaven's sake, I might as well have my horse a consul as you <laughs> lot." Right? right. Dot dot dot. And then that sort of gets picked up. And then you know, if you look at um, what appears in newspapers about Roman emperors. That's the, you know, you'll find endless quotes which say, never has been a more stupid political appointment than the day Caligula made his horse a consul, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> right. And he never did, you know, so you always get on the Twitter and you say, he never did make his horse a consul. But it, it will be a battle that I will not win in my lifetime. And, and do you enjoy, I mean, do you enjoy, I'm, you're going to get asked this question, do you enjoy getting on the Twitter to ask, to reply to people who are, wrongly attributing Caligula to oh, his... Oh, yeah, that's the best. So, yeah, you sit and listen to um, the big BBC um, Radio 4 breakfast show in the morning, which is you know, the, the flagship news programme of the day, loads of interviews. And you can always be guaranteed that in one issue of the Today programme, over three hours, there'll be one appalling error about the classical world. Uh, and so it's great fun to get to, you know, you know at Radio 4 today. Um, you know, no, you know, Nero did not sit in the Colosseum. It hadn't been built yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All these kind of things. And, you know, it's quite, you know, it's... Because I wouldn't want to suggest that apart from all these other things, I'm a frightful old pedant. And I can't bear people getting the... Oh, I'm sure I get some facts wrong, it's terrible, but you know, I can't bear other people getting facts wrong. <laughs> and, I mean, nuance is everything in what you do, but I, I found this wonderful phrase in one of your blogs. Suppose Hitler had written the best article ever on Lucian's Today as Syria. Would I recommend it to my students? <laughs> It's a fantastic, yeah. fantastic line, and it's so you, if I may say. Would you? <laughs> Which I do. <laughs> well, this is a real tricky one, isn't it? Uh, and probably yes, is the and answer. And that's why she's in a controversy at the moment yeah. in Great Britain. But anyway, but go on. <laughs> I, think, I think it's... Uh, apart from being a frightful old pedant about facts about the classical world, I also don't... I don't much like what I perceive as modern, now I suspect it's forever been with us, the kind of armchair moral certainty that, that we tend to have about the world, about the past, about what we would do if we were you know, in situations where we deplore the behaviour of other people. And one of those, one of the really, really problematic areas which I do, to which I do not think there's a right answer. I mean, I've got my own personal answer and everybody's got to make their own minds up, is the awful fact that very bad people can write very clever things. And I simply don't know how you deal with that. They can also, very, very nasty, vile people can make the most wondrous works of art. They can erect the most glorious buildings. And... How do we get our heads around that? Uh, you know, I, I would not actually like to go around Italy demolishing buildings put up 
under the sponsorship of Mussolini. I would not like to get rid of Foro Italico. I think it's wonderful. Uh, and the question is, how do you then face that dilemma? And so I use the example of you know, Hitler having <laughs> written the best article on <laughs> Lucien's Day Day Assyria, you know, just to point that out. And, but it's not all that far from being the truth. I mean, one of the most controversial politicians of 20th century Britain from the right was Enoch Powell, who made the notorious and grossly racist speech, which had the famous phrase, indeed taken from Virgil, rivers of blood, um, and was also one of the best commentators and editors of the Greek historian Herodotus. And you have to, uh, you know, my answer to that is to face it. Um, and when I recommend that to my students, I'm always going to make sure that they know what they're reading. Sometimes it's very obvious, as I think they are all aware with somebody like Powell. I think they're much less aware about the politics of of the academic politics of Europe in the mid 20th century. Saying to Richard at lunchtime, um, I once uh, got a group of students together who were doing classics in the 19th century, and 19th and 20th century course on reception. And we were trying to sensitize them to the kind of political background of works that they used frequently. And I went to the library and I got out Amadeo Maiori's fantastic publication of the Villa dei Misteri from Pompeii. Um, huge, lavishly illustrated vellum cover. And I passed around to the students, there was about 20 of them, um, this book. And I said, just tell me, tell me about the book. Um, you know, I'm not interested today in the the paintings of the Villa dei Misteri. I'm interested in what you think about this book. And I said, oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? God, so expensive. Oh, it's binding, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it took about a quarter of an hour before anyone saw the fasces on the, <laughs> on, the, you know, on the spine. And then they, they didn't know what era fascista meant. They, had, they did not read this book as being a, a, a product in any way of Mussolini's regime. They, and they, and in some ways, of course, they didn't. But I think one, so I think I'm much more interested in getting them sensitised. And of course, the trouble about doing everything online is that it kind of hides that, you know? Yes. It really hides it. You don't, um, but I, I'm, I want to say, look, you have to, you, you have to face where this comes from. But it doesn't mean, um, you know, having a bonfire and burning it. So you've just been filming, and you're about to film the last episode of a new series, Civilizations, where you must have confronted this issue over and over again. Of people and, being nasty. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, we're remaking, in, in a way, the, I mean, very loosely. We're, we're making a programme in dialogue with the very famous Kenneth Clark Civilization. Um, series, which in fact was most was made particularly popular here um, before it was ever really popular in the UK. And Clark had a program which was resolutely European. He came to the States, I think, twice or probably once. He went to um, uh, he went to Virginia, and he went. He had a quick look at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, that, I'm afraid, was as far as he got. Uh, all the rest was in Europe, and he didn't even get to Spain. He didn't think that uh, there was much worth seeing in Spain. Um, and we're trying to make this programme in a way that does not... that, that transcends those boundaries. Um, and that's why it's called Civilizations with an S on, which is a rather crude way of indicating that it's wider. Um, but, of course... I mean, I think there's all sorts of problems. I mean, I, I, hope, I hope we've negotiated the problems successfully. The, the thing I found about this programme was not 
so much having to confront nastiness because you know if you've worked on the Romans all your life you're quite used you know actually <laughs> you know we don't we don't not read Virgil because of what he did you know to you know probably innocent slaves do we? Um, so it wasn't the nastiness of the people we're dealing with. It was, it was a kind of sense really of how you could ever get over the, the ethno, really get over the ethnocentricity of Clark. Because to start with, you, you, you make the programme and you think, well, I know we're going to, we're not going to be as narrow as Clark. We're going to, you know, we're going to see them part of Mexico, of India, of New Zealand. Um, uh, uh, we're going to spread widely. Um, far afield from Europe. Did you come to the New World? Uh, my programmes didn't. Well, I went to Mexico, but the other programmes did. Um, but then you see that to be, to make a programme that is really culturally diverse and really taking, um, from the point of view where we started, other cultures seriously, you know, it means it needs more than just adding a bit of Japanese art onto uh, you know, and going to India. It's not, you know, being, having a diverse cultural vision doesn't just mean having a kind of bigger travel budget, you know, <laughs> going to more places. It has to mean a difference about the way you look. And I, for a long time, it took about three years to make this programme. And, you know, at one stage I felt very gloomy because I thought, look, I spent a long time lambasting to colleagues, Clark, for being so ethnocentric. You know, and doesn't even go to Spain, you know, as I've just said. And I thought, but you know, is my ethnocentricity really different from this? You know, here I am, you know, elderly, white, middle class lady, and, and what I'm doing is kind of the reverse of Clark. I'm kind of claiming competence. So here I am at Angkor Wat. You know, I'm now <laughs> going to tell you about this. Now, actually, I, I think my eyes were opened in all kinds of locations and I hope that we've got, I hope we have managed it. But just saying I'm going to talk about India doesn't make you more culturally diverse than Clark's limited knowledge. You flatter yourself, it does. But it's about, you know, cultural diversity is, a, is, is what's going on in your head, not just what country you decide to visit. Mm. And that's been the problem. And I hope, I hope we've solved it. I mean, or at least, yeah, I don't know, you never solve it. There's no, you know, there is no solution. But I hope we recognise the difficulties. And this starts in what, two weeks' time? In the UK it starts in, um, uh, on March the 1st. And there's going to be a version here... Um, on PBS, I think starting in April, um, that's significantly altered. That is to say, um, um, all the presenters have been removed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, it's American convention, apparently. They don't like what's called presenter led documentaries. Um, so, although uh, you see me being, you know, talking about objects, uh, all the words I wrote are going to be spoken by an actor. Really? <laughs> Even in Angkor Wat? The, the voiceover. <laughs> you know, in, in the UK version, I speak, and then there's a voiceover, um, uh, which I wrote. Now, right. uh, some of it's been changed. You know, to be fair, the PBS version has been adapted, and um, there have been a new bits have been added. But it is very, for me, it's very odd looking at it, because there's kind of what I say. And this is rather this rather famous actor whose name I can't remember is going to read it. No doubt, much better than me. Right, right, George Clooney. Yes. Oh, if only. No, it's somebody else. When I when I say the name and I can remember it, people always recognise it. But I'm afraid I don't. So, Mary, one or two more questions, and then I'm going to bring everyone else in because we've been going for nearly forty minutes. What's your next big challenge? What's your next book? What are you looking at apart from tweeting? Uh, yes, I'm going to give up tweeting for a bit, I think. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm just halfway through a book that... Um, writing a book, I mean, not reading it, that came out of the Mellon lectures I did here at the National Gallery about five years ago now, which was images of Roman emperors in Renaissance and later art. Um, that's something quite new for me. It's been extremely exciting. Um, and it's... I mean, it's got many aims, but... Um, what, and it's, it's quite an academic book 
Um, but one of the aims, bridges, I hope it bridges the audience. And I mean, I'm wanting to bring Roman emperors back from, you know, back from the dusty museum shelves. If you go to a museum uh, where they've got lineups of Renaissance 12 Caesars or whatever, uh, and you watch what people do when they're confronted by them, I tell you, they just walk past. Mm. They don't stop. Uh, I know that quite often I just walk past them. You know, they look dull. So the project of the book really, and this all, has all kinds of um, different aspects, but the main project of the book, I think, is to um, hope it will encourage people not to walk past them when they see them in a the museum, to stop and to think and to wonder about why we still, why we still, you know, you, you can still buy Nero on chocolates. Really? <laughs> you can still buy matches called Nero matches. What a joke, fire of Rome. You know? <laughs> uh, you know, why? Some, you know, some of the best modern artists still, it's not, we're not just stuck with Renaissance um, uh, sculptors churning out um, the cultural wallpaper of Four Caesars. We've got big modern artists, 19th century artists, recreating Roman imperial power, Roman emperors for us. And I'm wanting to make that seem exciting rather than slightly retro. Right? That sounds rather exciting. One last question before I bring the audience in, and, and it's this, and it's a slightly unfair question really, but anyway, nothing's unfair with you really, so <laughs> we'll go for it. You've really changed British classics for the better. I mean, uh, if you go up and down Britain and you talk to people in uh, the liberal arts, they all say classics is prospering, and then the next two words are Mary Beard. Why do you think that is, Mary? What, what is it about, what is the cult of Mary Beard? <laughs> because you, of all people who began by studying cults, yes, have become one. I am. Um... I, I, I'm very flattered, but I don't think it's entirely true. And this goes back to something that I said uh, at the beginning of our discussion, that you know, classicists, professional classicists, always think that their subject is about to go down the tubes, but has just been just being rescued. It's you know, hanging on by the skin of its teeth. And, and I've done quite a lot, and I've worked hard, and a lot of other people in the UK and uh, in the US you know, do huge amounts to interest young people, old people, school students in classics. So I, you know, I've, I've had, in, in some ways, the advantage of being on telly to do that, but I, I basically do what my colleagues do. But I think also we forget that classics, actually, if you look back, there have always been people doing this. When, when I was a, a school student, um, there were a series of books by Michael Grant yeah. uh, that were biographies of emperors that were best-selling coffee table books. Yeah. And I remember, must have been in the 70s, um, you know, sitting at home watching the BBC's adaptation of I, Claudius, which was here yeah. on Home Box Office, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, if you look at it now, you can tell that it was made on a budget so low that they never went outside. You know? and this was, it was amazing. It was kind of really radical telly because they had to compensate for not going outside. So it, so it recreated brilliantly yes. the Roman imperial palace as a place of, you know, Dark. Deep, dark, deep proximity. Mm -hmm. And they lingered for five minutes on the dying face of Augustus. That's yes. because they couldn't, hadn't got anywhere else to put the camera. Um, <laughs> and everything, all the scenery wobbles fantastically. Yes. And when, I'm afraid I actually saw the, um, the telly programme before I read the novel. Well, I read the novel, I was surprised they suddenly went to Germany and places like <laughs> this. They had never done that on the telly. Um, so I think that there's always been this kind of the, the, classics has always, you know, managed to retain its popularity in different forms. Look at look at Spartacus. You know, I am Sp you know, everybody in the street. That's the other thing they could say. I am Spartacus. Yes. I am Spartacus. Uh, ben Hur. You know, the blockbuster novels of the late nineteenth century uh, were very much classics. The er early movers were classical, and so I think that we're we, we're guilty of a bit of amnesia. You know, 
um, when we say that, that that there's this new interest. I think you have to you have to fan it the whole time. Right. You know, if you if you stop fanning it, then it probably will go away. Then you fan it for a new age with a blog and a that's, tweet. That's right. You do it in different form. I'd be no good making a film. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Or writing a novel. But yeah. you know, Robert yeah. Harris's Cicero novels and his Pompeii novels. They're fantastic. Fantastically yes. good and have enormous. Uh, audiences. Yeah. So I think that one's got to be a bit humble. You know, I've, I've done my bit. Lots of other people, you know, in the profession and outside the profession, you know, are doing their bit. And actually, it's part of the grand tr tradition. <laughs> now we've been talking for three quarters of an hour, believe it or not. So are there some? Let me ask. I can see one question in the back. Short questions, please. And not too controversial, just in case. <laughs> because I'm not sure I can always control her. <laughs> so I'll take the gentleman at the back. I'd like to, uh, thank you for, uh, very much, Professor Beard, for making the trip. I'd like to ask you uh, specifically if there are any uh, famous radicals at the time of Rome, uh, for instance, a Christopher Hitchens type, if, if you will, um, if, if be that with preachers of Democritus, perhaps, or Hypatia in, uh, in Alexandria. Uh, and also, I'd like to have your thoughts also on the elegant marbles, if you think the British Museum could return those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm not controversial, eh? <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll just get my tape recorder out, Mary. <laughs> what's interesting about Rome is it's full of radicals, but with some exceptions, and of course Lucretius would be one of them, um, particularly in the late Republic, they're written out by Cicero. <coughs> you know, I, I think you know, we now think of the Tribune, Publius Clodius Pulcher, you know, as some terribly wicked, um, you know, almost terrorist, and certainly Catiline falls into that category. And we think that because we only have the view of the opposition. So I think there are, there's a wonderful radical tradition in Rome. Um, and you see a little bit of that when you look at the stories they tell about the early Republic and the idea of you know, Tribunes fighting the power of the elite. Um, but much of it is kind of whited over um, by the traditions of Cicero, you know, who is so dominant. On the Elgin Marbles, I have a very simple answer. I am on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I see many bad reasons for sending them back and many bad reasons for keeping them. And can you see a solution? I can't see a solution because I think we're not actually done and if there was an easy solution we'd have found it. Yeah. You know, when, when these controversies go on and on and on, that is normally because there isn't an answer. Yeah. And I think, that, I think this is, you know, the question is to whom do the elder marbles or the path in the marbles, to whom do they belong? We can't answer that question easily. And uh, if you haven't read it, Mary's beard on the Parthenon is uh, Mary's <laughs> book on the Parthenon is really superb in <laughs> illustrating exactly that nuance. Please. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and uh, does this work? Okay. Uh, I was uh, interested in the fascination that you have mentioned by the Brits in general and the old Brits as well about the Latin world, the Roman world. And in particular, what fascinates me is that apparently there was a chair of Latin in Britain established within the university system much before there was one of English. And uh, also, um, you, you probably well know, of course, that uh, Arthur Golding, the uh, Brit, was uh, translated the entirety of Ovid in, in, in real British rhyme, whereas Ovid does not rhyme the same way because he used the meter, of course, in a giant meter. So um, I say this because I also would like to ask you, first of all, how do you explain that fascination? Uh, probably that's very hard to answer. And then secondly, I'd like to ask you, how does the fascination with the gladiators and, and the movies and everything, how does that correspond to an actual educational system within Britain and within Europe now, uh, which allows for learning the language of life? Um, first answer I, uh, is obviously, you know, why were the Brits so absolutely um, embedded in a culture of Latin? 
Um, I think it's a strange mixture of cultural inferiority and superiority. You know, there's a, uh, you know, a, a sense that um, Britain had in part, or some, some aspects, some parts the British elite had, that they, that they were Johnny come lately's that, uh, <coughs> that actually they needed the, the validation of the long tradition of particularly Latin learning. Greek was never so important. Um, combined with the sense of superiority that they were the best guardians of it, as usual. I mean, most kind of superiority comes with its, um, with a matching inferiority. And um, you know, I think there was a, a sense that um, Britain could be the heir to, to Rome. And a sense, I have to say, embarrassing as it is in this context, that they were um, better equipped to preserve classical culture than um, the modern inhabitants of Rome and Italy. While all, all the time looking desperately for the validation of that kind of tradition. Um, uh, you, know, you could do there other all kinds of other factors which plough into that, you know, such as the the universe, relative universality of Latin, the kind of cultural, um, the, the cultural spread uh, within uh, within a pan-European elite culture. I mean, I have to remember, you know, for all we're saying this, it's, it's only the posh that learn Latin. You know, it's not um, most most people. And this, I think, fits with your second question. Most people have always read Latin in translation. We should not feel ashamed, I think, for doing that. Um, uh, I think there is a that there is a direct feed off between um, you know gladiator and movies and that excitement and people getting curious about the ancient world and then <coughs> curious about about the language in which um, Latin literature was written. I mean, uh, there are, there are, is a kind of radical fringe in the UK that would say we want to go back to a school system, a high school system in which everybody learns Latin, I think that would be completely ghastly um, and it was never the case anyway, it was only the rich you know, um, we, we tend to look back to um, the culture of um, people knowing Latin as if somehow everybody did but it was, it was the elite and what's happening now, I think, is that people are coming into it, not because they're made to do it, but because, you know, in all kinds of ways, all sorts of different routes, they, they become interested in learning. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it'll die out. It's at the heart of Mr Johnson's, our Foreign Secretary's views of the oh, world. Oh, Boris Johnson, yes, yes. yes. Please. Yes, that's not a great recommendation, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, at the risk of getting a little close to the edge, has it ever crossed your mind in considering the Romans in Judea to read a paper, uh, right in order, but read a paper in which the Romans are the good guys and the Jews are the bad guys. Has it crossed my mind to read one? Well, to consider that. I, and I, I ask that because people have asked me, no. is that a subject that you can actually speak on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me put it more generally. <laughs> that may be wise. <laughs> um, I think that every time you look at an encounter between the Romans and anybody else, one of the things that you always say to the students to do, now tell a story from the other side. Uh, and that is, um, that could be Romans and the Jewish revolt, Romans and Christians, I mean, getting a load of undergraduates to write an essay explaining from the, from the pagan Roman point of view why the persecution of the Christians was a very good idea is an excellent exercise. It doesn't mean they have to believe it. Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, I think one of the things, although you raise an, an area where this, it, it would be less easy, I think one of the things that ancient history is good for in, in, within pedagogy is that it is a very long time ago and you can have debates about uh, 
which fit things, which take the other side, which say the unacceptable, that we wouldn't want to have even about the 19th century, let alone about arguments now. And so in, in some ways, there is a kind of, there's a space in Rome and Greece, and it's a, you know, there's, there's dangers, but there's a space for talking about, about arguing the unacceptable and seeing what that sounds like. Because I think, you know, if, if you don't see what the unacceptable sounds like, you'll never be able to contest it. Please. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And uh, if I may um, ask, uh, when you brilliantly spoke about the uh, descriptions that are made of the characters and those of power during the period of time you're discussing, and what was left out, and what was not described accurately, and uh, up to genocide, uh, when you look at the United States, for example, today, or, or the last 40 years, let us not just focus, uh, and, uh, and you look at the, dare I say, rot that seems to be um, from within, um, and uh, the relationships of the ruling classes, if you can use that term, how do you, uh, or would you, or does it make sense to, uh, you know, a word of caution that draws from uh, the epochs that you're studying, and apply to the current period of time, and particularly in the context of honesty. Oh, honesty. Oh, that was a surprise. <laughs> um, I think two things to that. Um, one, uh, I, uh, I, oh, I really hesitate before ever saying that, that there are direct lessons that the ancient world has to teach, or that you can make direct comparisons between antiquity and now, uh, despite the fact that that's what every journalist almost always wants you to do. I can't tell you, since your new president, how many times I've had an email from a journalist asking me which emperor Donald Trump is most likely. <laughs> and it's always very hard to know what to do. I, you know, either to explain, that's a bloody stupid question, or I... What I tend to do is give them an emperor that they won't have heard of, so that <laughs> to go and pick it up. But I think that to be more positive than that, um, so I, I resist direct comparisons. But I, again, I think that what what these discussions, what knowing about antiquity and debating about antiquity does, is it does help to open up a space in which people can look afresh at those problems for themselves. And I think that it is, you know, a bit like what I was just saying. I think it's, particularly in teaching students, you find that the kind of arguments that you can have about the ancient world uh, can be particularly fierce, gloves off, or on, I'm not sure, um, without anybody mostly getting hurt by them. You know, you can, uh, you can actually argue about Nero's persecution of the Christians um, in a way that, that I think exposes all kinds of issues, which whose, some of whose implications and some of whose ways of thinking um, you, can, you can then use to look at your own politics or religious conflicts f from a fresh standpoint. So I would never want to say that you know, I think history is really, really useful for kind of turning you into an external view of yourself. And so I think that's really important. I, I don't know what I think about honesty, partly because the ancient Romans were never much interested in it, really. <laughs> I think. Um, but I, I think it it lets you look afresh at your own world. And, it, you know, if you have a... You know, it's, it's, it's hard, and I think it gets harder in universities to have a direct, fully frontal argument with students about modern politics. They feel quite um, um, anxious. They can feel 
a little bit uh, exposed. But if you go through it, uh, through something that happened 2,000 years ago, you get something much more productive. Please. Were the ancient Romans writing standardised Latin? Um, not half as standardised as the versions of it that we now have, um, in so far as ancient texts as copied out and recopied out and edited over the last, say, 2,000 years, has tended, not entirely, not entirely universally, but is intended to push um, the, la the Latin that we now read um, into an increasingly kind of literary Latin form as generations of scholars have corrected the mistakes, etc., etc. Now, um, you know, even with Cicero, I think, quite well, actually, Cicero or his slaves wrote down on the papyrus in 63 BC maybe quite a long way from the Latin that we now read. And certainly the spoken Latin of the street um, was a much longer way. Um, and I think there is something quite uh, difficult about, you know, Latin is a very, is, people often say Latin is a hard language. I don't actually think Latin is any harder than any other language in the world. I don't think, I don't think languages can be kind of, they can't be hierarchized in terms of hardness. Um, what we've got is some, well, what survives and why we think it's hard is that we have this extremely literary survival. So that you know, when students are made, first of all, you know, to um, confront Tacitus, for example, um, with a very particular, peculiar style, that is not, you know, when we ask them in their second year of Latin to read Tacitus, it is like asking you know, a new learner of English to read Finnegan's Wake in the second year. You know? It's really, really hard. Um, um, so the, there is a very strong literariness. And partly, in, uh, uh, I mean, one I think has been intensified over the years rather than the other way around. I have a question here. Please. Thank you. Please. Thank then we've got to It's great to be here. I didn't say that. It's really great to be here. <laughs> Um, globalization, diversity, and migration are all hot topics. Um, I know from some of your readings that uh, uh, some of the emperors were not Italian, some of the British governors were not even European. Can, is there something to be learned from ancient Rome uh, that would help us confront the current topics better? Yes, I think there is. I mean, again, I think there's no direct lesson, and I don't think. Um, that any of us, let alone any politician, would be well advised to go back to Rome and to find, to find the answer to migration or any of those topics. What Rome does do is, again, it's, <coughs> it's showing us a di that you could think about it a different way. I mean, I think what is really, really striking about Rome is both the incorporation at the level of the elite, you know, so that by the second century AD, you've got Spanish emperors on the throne. It's Rome's view of itself. And if you go back to the two founding legends of Rome, Aeneas and Romulus, both of them are quite extraordinary, you know, because Aeneas is a, is a war refugee, actually, from Troy, finding, founding the Roman race in Italy. Uh, uh, when Romulus founds the city, first of all, he kills his brother, and then he looks around and says he hasn't got enough men, so he says, anybody can come here. Anybody can come to Rome. Uh, asylum seekers, thieves, runaway slaves, anybody can come here. Now, neither of those things are, of course, those, in, those are entire mythic constructions. But what I find interesting is that you've got this, this massive uh, polity eventually a massive empire, who imagines its origins as always foreign. Rome was always foreign, whether it's Aeneas, whether it's the runaway slaves, whether it's the asylum seekers that, uh, that Romulus welcomes. And I think 
when we think about our now America is different, but certainly in Britain, you know, although you know there are occasional self-congratulatory moments when the British say, "Oh, we have always welcomed migrants," you know, and given them a, usually a bloody hard time. Do um, uh, we? We don't somehow conceive of ourselves as a nation that is always foreign. Now, I think that. Uh, it would be much closer to some versions of um, American self-representation than, than a British or other European representation. That's a wonderful point, Mary. Another question, please? Ah, okay. The question here, I was just struck by what you were talking about, Latin, the literary aspects of, of it uh, as what survived. Uh, someone who studied Latin and remembers talking about conjugations and the collection and all through, through college and everything, they, uh, never really spoken, uh, you know, you read what's on the page, you translated what you did and everything, but now in certain parts of the U.S. there are, um, there are uh, efforts to try to introduce it almost as a, as a spoken yes. language. If someone said to you, Professor Beer, you have to teach 12-year-olds, right, and introduce them to Latin, would you, would you, would you see the utility in, in that sort of approach? <laughs> I, I, I see the utility and I applaud all these different versions of how people try to get kids particularly interested in Latin and I'm, I'm quite certain that that's one way that's quite important to try personally I have to say it's the fact that you don't have to speak Latin that's always <coughs> made me rather keen on it you, know? <laughs> you don't have to say where's the station and how much does this pizza cost it, I've always found it very tedious when it comes to learning a modern language so I like Latin very much on the page not speaking it um, although I have to say I'm going to be slightly uh, flippant here because I have seen um, here a bit in the UK, but not so much, um, that you know, this has got people into Latin uh, through a different way. And then there's you know, what used to be Reggie Foster's classes at the Vatican, That's true. Um, you know, where you know, everything was conducted in Latin, I believe. That uh, leaves me absolutely horrified. But isn't there, a, absolutely horrified. isn't there a team in the Vatican who are working on new words? Yes, I know. I, I seem to remember many oh, years ago no, sharing no. dinner uh, with someone who was working on hydrofoil. And he worked on hydrofoil for a year before I'm coming to a conclusion. But he got a fellowship from the United States. Please. <laughs> and there's, there's a load of wonderful, charming Finns who put out the news in Latin on some radio station every day. And you, you think you both bless this as an activity of, of, you know, of total innocence. But you also think, it's kind of mad. Yes. Yeah. Please. We've got two or three more, so... Yes, this is fascinating. I'd, I'd very quickly like to follow up on the ethnic diversity question and how Rome is more like America, a nation of immigrants, and perhaps our mother country, which contributed relatively little DNA to our current population. Uh, but America is a country that's been scarred by slavery and continues to. And in America, Racism. Now, I didn't learn this in Latin class, but I've since been told that there were lots and lots of slaves undergirding the Roman economy. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't hear about there being racist rationale. Um, the, uh, the, Rome was a slave economy. Um, I think that what is um, the, the differences are that. Um, the, there was no link between ethnicity, no necessary link between ethnicity and slavery. Um, slaves were a product of Roman expansion wherever and whenever Rome went. But the other factor which has to be borne in mind is that in urban contexts, and I don't think this would have applied to rural contexts, but in urban contexts, the Romans were absolutely extraordinary and unique in the ancient world, and noticeably unique. This was commented on by other ancient cultures, that they regularly freed their slaves. But not only did they free the slaves, uh, but the slaves, on receiving their freedom, if freed by a Roman citizen, became a Roman citizen. 
So uh, if you compare Athens, um, Athens, classical Athens rarely, occasionally did, rarely freed slaves. But slaves didn't enter the politics. The freed slaves didn't enter the polity. They remained, they remained as it were, stateless. Now, in Rome, you have this, as I say, for the ancient world, utterly unique uh, sense that the freed slaves become fully, fully participatory citizens. Now, that has all sorts of consequences, not so much in the ethnic diversity of the Roman population, but in, in the cultural diversity of the Roman population. So it, it, nobody knows quite the extent to which it, um, the numbers that, for this which happened. Um, but it, it isn't inconceivable that by the time you get to the second century AD, approaching 50% of the Roman population had slave ancestry. And that, I think, that is an extraordinary total for a, for a pre-modern community. So it, it's, it, we don't know how many slaves there were. Um, we have a tendency, I think, not slightly to, um, to give a, a rosy picture of Roman slavery, because we don't look at the industrial slaves, we don't look at the agricultural slaves, largely because there's so little evidence that we can get for them. Um, and we look at the, tend to look at the household urban slaves. And so, you know, it is an, an appalling slave economy, but it's a slave economy that reincorporates the slave. Now, it's commonly said that this is, as you can instantly see, this is not um, because the Romans were nice. Um, in part, it is a highly economic, rational calculation that what you don't want is an old slave because it's very expensive. So in some ways, it's a brutal bit of economics, but it has a long-term effect on the composition of the Roman people. We're going to take one last question, I'm afraid, because time is going on. So. Uh, we look at the Pax Americana as a great virtuous thing, but it certainly seems unlikely to last as long as the Pax Romana. Uh, can you comment on, on how virtuous that was, or the, and what kind of politics uh, went through the Roman society as it in, near its end? Um, not sure about the, the second one, I'll try. Um, it, the Pax Romana depends whose side you're on. Um, and the Pax Romana comes like most pieces uh, at a cost. And in fact, um, if you were to say, how would I best translate Pax, the Latin word Pax, um, in an ancient context, it would be something much more close to pacification than to peace. Right? It's, it's actually, it's peace won by war. Um, and Pax is what you get after war. And, um, you know, tell that to Boudicca um, and to the other um, rebels <coughs> against the Roman Empire. Um, by and large, the Roman Empire sustains its pacification by the collaboration of the local elite, um, but it always ran the risk of the local elite turning as Boudicca did, she was the wife of, of a local king. So it's, uh, I, think, I think our problem in the term is not whether it was the Pax Romana, but how we would translate Pax. And when we say the Roman peace, you know, we tend to think of it as frightfully sort of cute and sweet and you know, well-meaning, a kind of UN version, you know, right? <laughs> and actually, well, it's a different side of the UN version, I suppose. How it ended, you know, is one well is about the biggest question of um, the whole of Roman history. I mean, which is I mean, or second only to how the hell they managed to get an empire in the first place, um, how they lost it, and what the politics was of um, the decline of the Roman Empire um, is well, it's impossible to summarise in half a minute, and it's. <laughs> 
you know, in some look, crude version, they overstretched. But if you said, but they overstretched while still lasting several hundred, you know, it wasn't a bad go. If, if what you wanted was an empire, they did, you know, I wouldn't, but if what you wanted was an empire, they did quite well at it. Um, but with all the costs, with all the difficulties, uh, with all the ways it eventually undermines itself, you know, we, um, you know, we can rehearse these from any empire you like. The, the subaltern class, you know, in the end, quite understandably, um, uh, become a, a destabilizing, not a stabilizing force. You know? I'm going and to. It's nasty. Roman Empire's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> One last word. Tomorrow, Cam Gray from Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and I are talking about the end of the world, end of the Roman world, in the Cosmos Club at 10 o'clock. And we're talking about uh, pandemics, and we're talking about uh, volcanoes, and we're also oh, talking, the old and we're talking about the kinds of things that Mary's been describing too. What a wonderful evening. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> I'd like to thank the Italian Embassy, I'd like to thank all of you, but most of all, Professor Beard, she is wonderfully, wickedly subversive, but at the same time, amazingly knowledgeable and a real treasure. In Britain, she's known as a treasure. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.